Mon nom est Tim Barber. Je suis un des euh, fondateurs de Canada 2020. Je voudrais euh, vous présenter euh, Susan Smith. Tom Pitfield n'est pas ici maintenant, notre président. Where's our fearless leader, chairman? Don Newman. Welcome, everybody. Uh, before I get started, uh, I know those of you who come to Canada 2020 events have probably heard this now uh, upwards of 50 or 60 times, but I need to repeat this. I'm told it's just sinking in at that point. So Canada 2020 is Canada's leading independent progressive think tank working to redefine the role of the federal government. We produce original research, host events like these, and start conversations about Canada's future. Our goal is to, to build and to continue building a progressive community of people and ideas that will move and shape governments into the future. Canada 2020 is the most important group of reflection independent and progressive who seeks to redefine the role of the federal government. It engenders a research original and so that conversations sur the future of Canada. I was going to put that in Spanish, but I apologize. I'm not. I'm, I'm just going to be bilingual today. Today's topic: climate collaboration and the Canada-Mexico relationship. We're delighted to have with us our guests, who will be introduced in a moment by Melanie. Since our founding conference in June 2006, was by the way just several weeks ago, we celebrated our 10th anniversary, which is very exciting. At our at our uh, inaugural conference, we hosted uh, Vice President Al Gore. And I remember when we announced Al Gore was coming, everyone said, that he's yesterday's guy. But about a month later, he appeared on the, the, the front cover of Vanity Fair, and everyone said, that was brilliant. <laughs> and in French, we say, par hasard. It was completely, not by design, but completely by accident. But anyway, I came out with this movie, and of course, the rest is history. It was a phenomenal event. Uh, it was a, a huge success. It was a great way to kick it off, uh, kick off our, our beginning. And we've focused on issues related to climate change and finding a balanced policy on the energy and environment file uh, for the last decade. We've hosted a number of events that feature discussion on carbon pricing and other policy instruments that could bend the demand curve in the energy sector. So for the past 10 years, it wasn't the easiest of environments to have these discussions, but we did manage. That was then, and this is now. We've published a number of papers on issues related to climate change, or the climate challenge, rather commissioned a major poll on Canadian and American perceptions on carbon pricing, and held over a dozen events related to the energy and the environment. We've, fe we've featured speakers like Al Gore, Tim Flannery, Lorraine Mitchell-Moore, Eric LaChapelle, Dan Jurgen, um, Elizabeth May, Premiers Wynn and Premier, uh, Premier Couillard at, the, at our last uh, major event in last November, and most recently with Minister Carr. And, and uh, also at our big event in November, we were very pleased that we had the newly minted Minister of Environment and Climate Change, Catherine McKenna. In other words, we've been looking at these issues for over a decade, and we're very, very pleased to continue that tradition today. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Melanie, and she will introduce our, our participants. Thank you. Thanks, Tim, for the introduction, and uh, good afternoon, salut, buenas tardes, and that is the end of the trilingual portion of today's panel. <laughs> uh, we are so thrilled to have with us, honest, on, sorry, the Honorable Catherine McKenna, who made a huge splash on the world stage, of course, in the first few weeks after being elected in Paris. And we have also uh, Secretary uh, Rafael Pacchiano, Mexico's Secretary of Environment and Natural Resources. In Mexico, you may, know, may not know, was one of the first of the developing countries to have its plan in for the Paris uh, more than seven months in advance. So let's talk about Paris to start. We're about six months post Paris, uh, the Paris Agreement. The next meeting on progress and our commitments will be in five years. What have you done since then? And where do you hope we are five years from now? So you're starting with me? Whomever wants to go first. Well, please, please uh, uh, first. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> so I, I will say that uh, Secretary Pacchiano, Raphael, and I have worked very closely together. We worked very closely in Paris, uh, in post-Paris. Um, in terms of what we're looking to see, so I can talk about the Canadian context, but first I'll start with the international context. I mean, it's one thing to sign an agreement, and we all worked really hard. There were a lot of late nights, uh, some hand-wringing, uh, 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 yeah, so there was, there was a lot of work put into it, but now we need to make sure that it uh, comes into force early, so we're looking, uh, we're really pushing um, to see countries ratify 
Um, but beyond that, we need to focus on transparency and accountability. That's going to be really important to ensure that countries actually meet their obligations. Developing countries, one of the reasons we were able to get a, an ambitious agreement in Paris was that developing countries recognized that, that they had the support of developed countries. So we announced $2.65 billion in climate financing uh, to the least developed countries. And so that was really important part of it. Um, and I think also it's focusing on um, how do we move forward and make sure that every country improves so that we know that countries have come up, each country for the first time ever, 195 countries have committed to having a climate plan where they're going to reduce their emissions, but we know that's not enough. So really it's making sure that we have the mechanisms in place so that each country comes back. And, and I'm sure there'll be, you know, opportunity to get into more details. I mean, this is what we are now uh, doing what was done in Paris, which is the really hard work to get an agreement, a pan-Canadian agreement, where we work with all the provinces and territories to figure out how we're going to meet our international obligation, and we know where our emissions are coming from. It's no secret. Uh, it's coming from buildings, or coming from vehicles, or coming from oil and gas, or coming from agriculture and forestry. So we know the areas, and now we need to figure out what are the tools, and how do we move in a thoughtful way where we are working together uh, with not just the provinces and territories, key, but also working with business, working with environmental NGOs, working with indigenous leaders, um, and working with all Canadians. And so that's the hard work we're doing right now uh, through a working group process where experts are looking at, you know, we're getting submissions and hearing from, from different experts, uh, different groups about how to reduce emissions in different sectors. We're also doing town halls across the country. Uh, and it's not just members of parliament, although if your member of parliament hasn't done one, I did one, uh, please, uh, please ask them to. Um, but also we have all sorts of groups that are doing uh, town halls. We have a town hall toolkit, so we see environmental groups, faith groups, youth uh, are doing these, um, uh, are doing these town halls, and then we have an online portal, which sounds really boring, um, and it kind of is really boring. What it is is everyone is asked to put their submission uh, with their solution, their climate solution. So that's everyone from the world's expert in ag better agricultural practices to kids. And I want that, we, we need that information because we can feed it into the working groups, but we can also make sure that everyone can see these solutions. We've already seen unusual suspects, what I like to see when you have environmental groups, when businesses coming together with solutions that they think will work. And that's gonna lead to uh, the first minister's meeting in the fall where we're gonna announce uh, our pan-Canadian climate plan. And one thing I always like when, when, uh, when you guys talk about your past uh, discussions on carbon pricing, carbon pricing clearly uh, is part of the solution. Mr. Secretary, your turn to tell us uh, what, you've got, what you've been doing and what, what you're uh, in Mexico. Thank you. Let me, let me start by telling you another thing about Mexico. Mexico was the second country in the world to have a climate change law after the UK. So we have been working a lot, having all the regulations that we needed to, to start the implementation of the Paris Agreement. We have all the regulations right now, they're finished, so we have to implement what are, uh, what are stated in the regulations. We have, uh, since the Paris Agreement will start in 2020, and we, we, our laws, they demand us to, to take actions even before, and even if we, if we want to get through the, uh, a successful implementation of the Paris Agreement, we have to start working right now. So we're, fin we're finishing all the infrastructure that we need to switch from, uh, from burning fuel to, pr to produce uh, electricity in Mexico, which is our largest uh, generator of CO2 emissions. We are right now, we made the switch and we're only, well, we have reduced right now 50% of the total fuel that we used to burn and we're burning right now uh, natural gas. We just passed an energy reform that actually allows us to, to have more natural gas and also allows uh, the private sector to invest in generating more renewable energies. Mexico has a strong potential for renewables. We have one of the most uh, important potentials for sun energy, also for wind power and also for geothermic. So we, we need to get to that point. Our law um, mandates us to, by 2024, to have 30, 35% from our uh, energy metrics to become from, from renewable sources. So we're trying to make those implementations right now. And, and obviously, I mean, Paris Agreement was a nice start, 
but we all know that it's not enough. If we want to reach the, the goal of 1.5 degrees Celsius by the end of the century, we have to go even further from, from the commitments. We are working along with, uh, especially with Canada and the US on, and, and see where are the areas of, of opportunities to be more aggressive because in five years we have to present new, new commitments for Absolutely. reductions and, and we have to start thinking where can we find this, these new opportunities and, and that's another very important thing that we're working on. And I'm gonna ask you a little bit about those renewables, the renewable target in a, in a, sec, in a minute, but I was also wondering another way that uh, Mexico is leading is the new head of the UNFCCC is yes, actually Patricia Mexican Espinosa. also, Patricia right. uh, Espinoso, Espinosa, excuse me. What skill set does she bring to the job and what do you think is her biggest challenge post Paris? Well, actually, she's, she has a lot of experience regarding with climate change because she was the Mexican min, uh, foreign uh, affairs minister in 2010 when we had the COP16 in Cancun. And it was a very challenging event because we came out from Copenhague where everything, everyone was very disappointed and it, it was not clear if, if, if the commission was going to to keep the pace and if, if we were going to be able to have a successful agreement. And, and Patricia was the, the main responsible, she, she was the president for the COP in that year, and she managed to return the confidence and, and the expectations to the, to the international community. So she's very involved in, 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 in this issue. And, and I think that naming her the, the president for the, for the UN, Commission for Climate Change, it, it's a recognition, one of her, her experience, but also to the Mexican leadership regarding climate change. So we know that Mexico and Canada have worked together quite a bit on, on climate. We've got uh, the Canada-Mexico partnership with an environment working group. There's the Climate and Clean Air uh, Coalition. And we know that uh, tomorrow with your US counterpart, you will be making an announcement. Feel free to give us a little snippet of that now. Um, <laughs> However, I, I, so I know you can't you know, let the cat out of the bag in 24 hours in advance. However, maybe you could talk to me, and, and perhaps, Minister, you'd like to go first. Why is a North American climate agreement uh, important from a continental perspective, but also from an international perspective? Uh, well, from a continental perspective, it just makes sense. Uh, we have integrated uh, economies. Um, it makes sense from a competitiveness perspective, and it also is a huge opportunity. So if you look at, you know, say Mexico's target for clean energy, uh, we, many people may not know this, but in Canada, 80% of our, of our uh, electricity is clean. Uh, because we have hydro, uh, but we also have nuclear and we have renewables. And so there's a real opportunity to help each other solve problems. So, you know, we can work with the U.S. and Mexico uh, with uh, interties. And I think that's, I mean, that's certainly one way to do it. I think also, I mean, we, we try to ensure that our standards uh, are aligned. Um, that makes sense, once again, from a competitiveness perspective. So I think there's a, a lot of opportunity there. But I think, I mean, overall, it, this is such a good news story. I mean, it's, it's great because I always like seeing Raphael, uh, but uh, beyond that, I mean, it's, it's good news because when you see in the world uh, right now with Brexit and a lot of the other things that are going on, um, this idea that you would link and you would work together um, seems very scary for many countries and they seem to be going in the opposite direction, but here you see a really strong alliance um, where we're working together on climate change, but also you know, making the case, and it's, and it's absolutely true, that the environment and the economy go together. That there's real economic opportunities. We've uh, signed on, all three countries have signed on to mission innovation. So we're looking at how do we, uh, by doubling government investment in innovation, how do we find the technologies of the future, the real game-changing technologies that'll make a real difference. So in so many ways, we have a real opportunity to work together on a continental basis, which will be good for our companies. Uh, it'll be good for jobs, it'll be good uh, for all of, our, uh, all of our citizens. On the international front, uh, we've really seen how working together, so Mexico, Canada, uh, in the U.S. really pushing uh, on, uh, in, in terms of a Paris Agreement, but on other files where we can reduce emissions uh, has made a big difference. So we're working very hard to reduce emissions uh, from hydrofluorocarbons, so uh, refrigerants. Uh, that might sound very unglamorous, but in fact, they're much more potent, like thousands of times, tens of thousands of times more potent than greenhouse gases. Uh, so we need to be figuring out how do we get uh, an agreement there. We're both going to be working very hard. Uh, there's also IKEA. We're trying to get an agreement when it comes to aviation. Um, so I think that if we can take the momentum here, 
methane is another example of reductions uh, in, in the oil and gas sector. If we can take the momentum that we have here and bring it, in, you know, bring it to the international scene, uh, we will do a lot more in terms of meeting our international target, which is reducing emissions below two degrees, aiming for 1.5. And also, the, the another thing that makes a lot of sense is that you have Canada, who, who has best practices, especially for generating electricity in, in a clean way. But there is an example of a country that can go even further. So they're not staying in, in their comfort zone saying, no, you know what, I'm, I'm doing well because 80% of my energy comes from, from a clean source, so I'm OK. I will, I, will know, I will not make an extra effort. You have the US who finally agreed to do something, and, and one of the most uh, biggest generator of CO2 emissions. And then you have Mexico, which is a developing country that depends a lot on generating oil. And, and our position is, I, don't, I need to, to grow and to generate development, but I, I'm also very vulnerable and I have to take actions. So if you collect the, the three experiences and you give the message that if, if we are doing things and we can go an extra mile, the other, all the countries have to do the same because this is, this is the solution against climate change depend on all of us. And, and all of us, has to, we have to do our work. And, and I think that's a very powerful message that actually we were able to, to deliver that message in, in, in Paris. Mm -hmm. And I think we still have to, the, we have to transmit that message to other countries. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sneak in a follow up and I wonder if there's ever going to be a North American carbon pricing model. Wow, that's, a, that's an easy question. <laughs> uh, well, so I mean, I think that I think all three countries agree that we need market mechanisms and that carbon pricing is part of that, the solution. Uh, in Canada, we 80% of Canadians live in a jurisdiction or will live in a jurisdiction where there's a price on carbon. There are different models, carbon tax, uh, cap and trade. Um, and uh, linked with California. So I think that there are different opportunities. I think what you will see is movement to market mechanisms because it, it really is the lowest cost way to reduce emissions. It doesn't discriminate. It just says if you pollute, you will pay more or to put it in a more favorable way, if you pollute less, you will pay less. Um, and it fosters innovation. And I hear from businesses uh, including the Mining Association of Canada and their membership, as you can imagine, are some of the major, uh, major energy companies. They have said we want a price on carbon because we recognize that that's going to help us do what we want to do, which is you know, foster innovation um, in a low-cost way. So, I mean, how we end up and where we end up, uh, I think, you know, we're... we're we're going to, and you know, we'll see where we go. But I think that you are seeing this movement in a way that was never uh, discussed before. That actually, carbon pricing—it's not a dirty word. Like people can actually say it. Um, pricing pollution, and and so I see, think you're seeing some good momentum. And we're part of the carbon pricing. So Mexico uh, and Canada are car part of the carbon pricing leadership initiative uh, through the World Bank, where we're with major companies. Um, and the four provinces in Canada that have a price on carbon. So really creating the momentum around that. And that's going to be part of the puzzle. I mean, if we are going to, if we're going to be serious about tackling climate change, we are going to have to have a, a price on uh, pollution. And we need, because it, it's obviously a, the best way to reduce uh, emissions is to, have, is to have this tax. But also, since our economies are very integrated in order to maintain competitivity, at least for the Mexican companies, which our best clients are either Canada and the US. We, in order, if we have to, we want to remain competitive, we have to have that, that carbon market. And, and we already have a carbon um, tax in Mexico. We have uh, collected so far $1 billion. We started in late 2013, and it's working pretty good. We have to increase it because right now it's extremely low, but we, I think we gave the first step. So we have to move it forward. Uh, Mr. Secretary, my next question is for you. Actually, you mentioned the movement to clean uh, renewables for electricity, and I think you said the target goal was 35% by 2024, and currently are you're around 3%, is that right? Yes. So how, how do you get there? It's a great goal. How do you get there? Well, that actually, we're trying to work pretty hard on that one. Uh, we're exploring our nuclear. If we, we only produce like a very small amount of nuclear, we have to open that discussion. But I mean, the potential is so big for wind power and, and for solar power. And, and actually, we, we used to have that, that very small potential because the, the only one uh, uh, allowed to produce electricity in Mexico was the government. 
And that was before 2013 when we have this energy reform that we passed through Congress. So right now, I mean, the, the willing of investors, is, it's huge. We're having a lot of, of, uh, of inversion coming to Mexico, investment coming to Mexico for uh, investing in renewable energies. So we're, we're confident that we're gonna get there. Minister uh, McKenna, so you, we, you mentioned that you have another upcoming meeting with provincial leaders, the first minister's meeting in the fall, and you've had one in March, and there's been a conference call or two about climate. Uh, what do you see as the biggest goal in Canada towards uh, reaching our goals? Uh, so I've had many, many more than a few conference calls. In fact, I've, I've basically, <laughs> I'm traveling the country, meeting with my counterparts, because what we found when we you do the hard analysis is every province and territory is different. When you look at the profile of their emissions, while we know where the buckets are, how the buckets, they, they vary. I mean, if you're in Manitoba and you have hydro, uh, you know, the, the profile of emissions from electricity is very low. Um, so how, where are we gonna get the gains? Um, so we've talked about carbon pricing, that's certainly part of it. Uh, when we announced um, uh, the 40 to 45% reduction from methane in, in oil and gas, uh, that is, uh, actually has a, a very significant impact for a very low cost. Um, so we're looking at solutions that make economic sense and also are the, the ones that are actually gonna have a, a real impact in reducing emissions. So, I mean, I can kind of go through, I was speaking this morning at the Green Buildings Association um, and you know, clearly buildings. We have emissions, 15% of our emissions come from buildings. That makes no sense. It's just, we, we have poorly built buildings. We aren't looking at how do we have better targets? Like why don't we be ambitious like you know, Mexico and set targets like net zero buildings? Uh, in, in, if you look at Europe, the best practice is not passive buildings, it's active buildings. They're actually producing energy. And you can do this if you're thoughtful about how you do that. So buildings, vehicles, we know that we need to do more in terms of electric vehicles. Providing a federal government can certainly play a role in providing the infrastructure, uh, oil and gas. Uh, there's new innovations um, that we need to be looking at. So you can go through all of the, the different sectors and, and you will find solutions there. We just haven't done the exercise before. Uh, and also, we haven't looked at how do we support provinces, um, you know, through, uh, you know, it can be through investments, um, it can be through other measures to help them. So if you are on coal, we know we need to phase out coal, we just do. So how do we look at the federal government making investments in transmission lines? Um, between provinces, and that takes leadership. It takes leadership from the federal government. It also takes some time. Everyone's very impatient, but we will have a plan in the fall. But you know, it, it, it requires a will to do to be serious and to have a serious plan and to listen to experts, to listen to business, to listen to environmental leaders. But I mean, some of this isn't rocket science. It's just we have not taken the time to do this. We haven't taken the time to build the partnerships that we need. Uh, to do this, we haven't looked at a Canadian strategy. So you've seen provinces take, you know, their own initiatives, which is great. Uh, but in, sometimes it doesn't make sense, and there are competitiveness issues that we've already talked about. I think also a big part of this is going to be innovation. Uh, we know that there are going to be game changer technologies. There already are technologies that are out there, um, but we need to help. Uh, create the right incentives so that more people use them. So I'll say in government procurement, I'm hell bent that we're gonna do a much better job uh, when it comes to what our strategy is. I think we should be a net zero government. Um, so I'm looking at the clerk, he's probably maybe getting very nervous about that. <laughs> uh, but uh, look, I think we, we have to, we cannot expect everyone else uh, to bear, you know, to, to go and take these actions if we as a government are not doing this. So I think there's huge opportunities. Um, I see goodwill across the country. We have business, environmental NGOs who are coming together to say these are the things we can do. So I'm, I'm, I'm just thrilled because I actually think this is the first time where we really have a shot to do this. We can't waste it. Good point, and I want to jump on that uh, comment you made about innovation, because uh, as you know, the global trade in low carbon, uh, energy efficient technologies is predicted to be uh, more than two trillion by the year 2020, uh, and this is that's a triple than the current level, and it's a huge opportunity for everyone globally. Um, what is the pot uh, potential in your markets, uh, which are currently relying on extractive industries, let's be honest, for clean tech innovation, domestically and as part of NAFTA? Uh, well, I mean, so clearly clean tech, uh, we need to be fostering our, our, it's fairly nascent clean tech industry. We've seen, unfortunately, the numbers, we've gone in the wrong direction, that our share, our global share of clean tech has gone down. 
Um, but I think we have great entrepreneurs and great businesses out there. I was sitting, I was on a panel with uh, Mark Carney, who's a very busy, very busy person right now, uh, the governor of the, the Bank of England. Um, he, uh, I mean, he said actually that the opportunity in China alone, the numbers he has, is thirty trillion dollars. So we would be crazy as a country if we didn't recognize that this isn't just a good thing to do, it's the morally right thing to do, that this is a huge economic opportunity to create the jobs of the future. And our whole economy, let's be clear, is not relying on natural resources, but a significant chunk of our economy is. And we need to figure out how do we in a thoughtful way move to a lower carbon future and look at where are other jobs and opportunities. So I think that um, it just makes it sense for government to be working with with business, working with our entrepreneurs to figure out those opportunities. And one thing I'm looking at doing is going on the first ever trade mission where you have the Minister of Environment with the Minister of Trade uh, going to China and saying, here are, some, here are companies that are doing great things and here are solutions. And I think that's the kind of, uh, you know, that's the kind of approach. We have to be out there. We can't expect that people are going to come to us. Um, but we have to be out there with solutions. And I think, you know, also working, you know, on the continental basis where we can, you know, when we look at value change, when we look at, um, we look at the, you know, uh, automobile sector, I think there's some real opportunities for on a North American basis too. From our side, what we're trying to do is that since we have a lot of potential for producing renewables energy, energies in Mexico, all the equipment that you need to produce them, they're actually, they're imported. So we're trying to, to see how can we make the, these projects a reality, so how can we increase the number of projects of renewables so we can generate an internal demand that actually turns Mexico as a desirable country for all the technology producers to actually go to Mexico and to put plants so they can build the equipment there. We, because we offer a lot of competitive uh, advantages in Mexico as we are cheaper in, in, in labor costs we have the, the human capacity to, to build them because it's a very similar industry as the automobile industry in which we are very successful. And, that, and, and at the end of the day, that's green growth, to have a new industry that actually produces new jobs mm -hmm. but actually targets the, the, redu the reduction of emissions. So we're trying in President Peña Neto's administration to have this internal demand to, in order to be competitive for, for other companies to come and, and produce the equipment in Mexico. I wanted to move to natural capital, and we've talked about uh, carbon mitigation action plans, climate change action strategies. Where do biodiversity and uh, conservation fit into the picture? Well, I mean, biodiversity and climate change go hand in hand. Uh, it's part of my other responsibilities. I'm responsible for uh, addressing uh, concerns with species at risk. Um, and we know that we are just going to see an increase in, in species that are under threat because of changes in the climate. Um, and so that's really an opportunity. When we look at um, how we can uh, mitigate the impacts of climate change and also adapt to the, the changes of a climate, I mean, clearly looking at our natural capital, um, we have signed up for, uh, to the uh, UN IEG targets. Uh, which are ambitious targets where we would uh, protect 17% um, of our uh, land mass and uh, uh, 12, 10%, sorry, thank you, <laughs> have you there, 10% um, of our marine areas. Um, and that's going to be part of this. So we have, to be, we have to be thoughtful and we have to be aware that, you know, if we continue uh, to, to develop, um, we're having an impact that's going hand in hand with climate change. Um, and actually, there's opportunities there too. If you protect more uh, of your land mass, if you're more thoughtful in terms of you protect uh, the oceans, I mean, they are ways that they act as sinks. And so that's an important part of it. So I certainly see these aren't different. I, I think for a long time we haven't actually seen the links between biodiversity uh, and um, climate, but you are certainly seeing uh, you're certainly seeing that now. And of and in addition to that, also biodiversity <laughs> is threatened by other sectors, not only about climate change, but also agriculture threatens uh, all the biodiversity. The tourism development also, uh, it's, it, it's a very important threat to, to the ecosystems. Obviously, the, the forestry industry as well, and also the fishing industry. And, and that's why in Mexico we're having in, in December this year, we're going to host the Conference of the Parts for Biodiversity. 
and, and we're trying to get the ministers of, of agriculture, forestry, and obviously fishing and tourism to go there and see what kind of commitments can we get from their part to, to be a part of, of, of the effort of, of, of conserving this important biodiversity and, and ecosystems. Uh, and, and another fact of Mexico, just for the audience, is that we, only, we have 1% of the total surface of the world. But in Mexico, we have more than 10% of the total species in the world. Mm. We're one of the most diverse countries in the world. And a lot of our species, they're endemic. They only live in Mexico. So it comes with a huge responsibility to preserve that kind of, of, of natural resources. And, and we're doing our best, actually, our the, our Aichi commitments, we, we, are about, we should uh, make them by 2020, but we are committed to actually to move forward and, and to reach them by 2018. And this is an area that we are working really well together. Uh, so a really good success story is the efforts that have been led by Mexico uh, mm -hmm. with respect to the monarch butterfly. Um, there were real concerns, so monarch butterflies, have, apparently there's the most beautiful park that I want to go to where monarch butterflies, they migrate to every year. So they come from Canada and they go all the way down, but if they don't have places along the way um, where they can, you know, they can survive, uh, you know, it's, it has a real impact. So we've been able, I think, to triple uh, the population of monarch butterflies by being thoughtful, by creating corridors, by working together. And I think we're going to see, I mean, the reality is that borders, um, while it's easy for us in, in some ways in the, you know, real politic to think about borders, when it comes to, you know, species, they cross borders. They don't care about borders. And so that's why we have to have a continental approach to, uh, to, uh, to biodiversity. And actually, that's a very, success, a very nice success story because there's no way that you can count how many butterflies are arriving to your country. Yeah. So <laughs> how, you have to measure by what amount of, of surface they are occupying once they, they, they reach their destination. And the traditional average that of the surface that they occupied was about between six and eight hectares. But three years ago, we only received 0 0.6 hectares. So this, this, uh, this migration miracle almost disappeared. So that's why President Peña requested the creation of a, of a trilateral team so to find out what was going on. And working together with Canada and the US, we found out that they were disappearing the milkweed, which is a plant where the butterflies eat. So we respected and defined some corridors from all the way through Canada to Mexico. And, and this year, we had 4.1 hectares. And the total um, objective of the team is to reach 2018 having the six hectares that we traditionally had. So we're moving in the right path, and, and I think the, this demonstrates the, the good collaboration between the North American when we want to do things good in a, in work as a team. And I get to go there, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Bring the kids. That's part of the, that's part of the trilateral agreement. Yeah, that's you right. Get to go. <laughs> so um, I have a question for both of you, actually. Transportation is a huge part of Canada and, and Mexico's climate change commitments. In Canada, transportation is about 25% of our emissions. Um, from a policy and incentive perspective, how do Canadian and uh, Mexican governments get more public transit infrastructure and get more people using public transit? Well, you've seen uh, it's a huge priority of our government um, to invest in public transit. And in Ottawa alone, so the, the investment in the second phase of LRT, it will be the largest reduction in greenhouse gas emissions in Ottawa's history, 150,000 tons. Um, so that's something that, uh, you know, there's a real opportunity. We don't, we don't have great public transit in, in Canada. We just don't. And we're committed to, to doing that. We're committed to making investments with the provinces, with the municipalities, to figure out that piece. Another area that I care a lot about is active transportation. As many of you know, I like riding my red bike uh, as much as I can. And so it's making sure that we create the, that we create the opportunities to, for people to be able to ride their bikes. We know that a lot of the reason people don't ride their bikes, bikes to work is they don't feel safe. So we just need you know, bike paths. And when you, make, when you build LRT, uh, we know in Ottawa, for example, 70, uh, over 70% of Ottawans will live within five kilometers of LRT. But how do we get them from the five kilometers to LRT? Well, be smart about you know, what the transit opportunities are there. So I mean, I think that, that transit is a piece that we certainly have to be working with, um, 
with the provinces in the, in the territories uh, as well as the, the municipalities to come up with strategies that really work. And I've always said, you need to be, make public transit the irresistible option. Um, if you make it hard, if you make it really expensive, then people aren't going to use it. They're going to stay in their cars. And so you have to, you know, you have to create incentives uh, for people to take public transit and you have to make it easy for them to do it. And I think it requires a bit of shift in, in how we think. And it also requires all of us to, to say, you know what, I think it makes sense that I'm going to take public transit today, that I'm going to get my kids riding their bikes more, that I'm not going to take my car. Um, and, and so I think there's some real opportunities. I think that what, we're, what you will see, uh, so really that you, you may see tomorrow, <laughs> um, you know, elect, we're electric vehicles and having the proper infrastructure on a continental basis so that you know, if you're a truck from Mexico, you can make it all the way up. Uh, to Canada. And so I think that there's things that you can do locally, uh, there's things that you can do nationally, and then there's things that you need to think about on a continental basis. From our side, public transportation, it's also uh, one thing that was abandoned in, in the past. In this administration, we're investing in, in building trains, in also building subways, more, more lines of subways, no, not only in the Mexico City area, but in other provinces as well. Uh, for Mexico, over 32% of, of the emissions comes from the transport segment, which is, is, the, is the biggest segment that we have. Uh, electricity is number two. And, but also, we, have a, uh, we were way behind in, in technology. We, because of the quality of the fuels that we had, we, we were not able to have the latest technology that it's way more efficient than, than the previous one. With the uh, energy reform, we are now moving forward to have better fuels and we will be able to homologate or our regulations for also light vehicles but also for heavy trucks to be as, as clean as the, as the ones that, ha that you have in Canada and the US and, and that's also a huge step that we're taking that, that, uh, that, uh, that was necessary. I'm getting uh, alerted from our confidence monitor. This is maybe our last question. Uh, so I know, what are some other environmental issues that Canada and Mexico are tackling together? I know you have a commission for environmental cooperation this year. Besides the monarch butterfly, what would you like to see on the agenda? Well, I should really defer to my colleagues since they are the uh, chair. Well, with what we're aiming is to, to basically three things. Uh, first of all, it's how to preserve key ecosystems, but also how to how can we help people that actually live in these ecosystems to transform the, all the natural resources that they have, if they can exploit it in a reasonable way, how to, how to make, a, a, how to give them better conditions for living? Because in Mexico, in the most diverse regions of the country, we have the most poor there. So, Something's not good because we, we used to have a very conservationist uh, model in Mexico, which obviously doesn't work. And, and we have to transform it. We have to take best practices from, from the US and from Canada to, to give these people opportunities. Because the worst enemy for the environment is poverty. So we, we have to find way, new ways of, of these people to give them a, a way to live, to exploit uh, in a sustainable way the resources and, and to give them a, a better chance for living. And the other thing where, where we want to focus on is how can we involve the youth in the, in the protection of the environment? So those are the, the, the two main topics that I'm going to, 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 get to take to that meeting. There's a couple areas that we've been talking about together and also promoting internationally. It's the role of indigenous peoples mm -hmm. in this conversation. For too long, indigenous peoples have not been a part of our climate conversation. And we know not only are they feeling the real impact, but also they're the ones, uh, indigenous peoples, the Inuit that I've talked to, they already saw the impact of climate change using traditional knowledge. And we need to be really building that in and having them be part of the solution. Um, and so that's one opportunity. Uh, I do this because uh, I really think it's important. And I will see that Patricia Espinosa, as an example, we need to talk about the gendered impacts of climate change. Uh, and that means that uh, there are gendered impacts uh, when we look at women are more likely to live in poverty, but when you see the, the sectors they work in, they're more likely to work in the agricultural sector. We know the agricultural sector is good under you know, extreme threats um, with, with uh, high temperatures and, and uh, droughts. 
Um, so that's, I think, an important part of the conversation. And what's really great, so Raphael, you're a guy, but that's, well, that's OK. But uh, <laughs> there are a lot of amazing women who work on, on the climate change uh, front. That uh, We've seen uh, Christiana Figueres, uh, who is now being su succeeded by um, Patricia Espinoza. Uh, we've seen uh, a number of women who are really stepped up, and we've been part of the negotiations. And I think that's also really important because you do bring, uh, you know, a different perspective. And I think it's good role modeling. So that's something. Just so you know, we're we're going to get that on the agenda too. <laughs> Unfortunately, we don't have any question time for questions from the audience. But uh, I know you two have busy days ahead, uh, and I want to thank you both for being on our stage. I want to thank those of you who are in the audience today, as well as those watching online. Um, it's been wonderful to have you share your thoughts ahead of the North American Leader Summit and maybe give us a little taste of what we might see tomorrow. I also want to thank our sustaining partners, without whom uh, events like this wouldn't be possible. And thank you to all of us for joining us. Have a fantastic day. And on your way out, you can grab a recent report by Canada 2020 and a few other think tanks on our proposal for a North American climate strategy. Right, thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.